welcome to the Atheist Experience. Today is March 4th, 2018, and I'm your host, Tracy Harris. With me today is trans activist and host of the Gaytheist Manifesto and the Queer Side podcast, Callie Wright. Hi, thanks for having me. Super Huge excited. Huge audience turnout <laughs> for you today. Very exciting. Yeah, we had trouble finding parking. Yeah. <laughs> it was wild. Uh, the Atheist Experience is a a production of the Atheist Community of Austin, a Texas nonprofit educational organization dedicated to promoting separation of church and state and positive atheist culture. I have one special announcement today. There is a fundraiser going on at goaxp.org. I have a link at the blog for the open show thread on today's show. Just let people know we are sending 10 hosts and crew of the Atheist Experience and Talk Heathen live call in shows to the American Atheist Convention in Oklahoma City. We'll be broadcasting live from the main stage on Friday, March 30th, from 12 to 2 p.m. Central. To help make this possible, we're asking for your help to cover expenses for the volunteers. So just FYI, that's what that's about. And you can find the link again at the blog post for the open show thread. And I think that's everything I have as far as intro announcements. How are you doing today? I'm good. This is exciting. Oh, I'm well, we're so glad to have you. We, uh, we were very, very sad to have to reschedule for the Godless Bitches podcast. Right, on. yeah, that's, I, I just need to no. learn to read my email. No, it's the totally <laughs> okay. I mean, it happens, but we definitely would love to have you on there as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so tell me a little bit about yourself, about what you do. Yeah, so um, I'm a, a trans woman, trans activist. Uh, I do a show called The Gaytheist Manifesto with my co-host Ari. Uh, we're both queer trans folks and, uh, and we're both atheists. And so we talk about the intersection of those things and um, you know, how, how those things inform the ways, the, the ways that we navigate the world. Uh, and I also do a podcast called The Queer Side, which is more of a storytelling show along the lines of like Snap Judgment, um, This American Life, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, where uh, it, it's not really necessi necessarily related to religion or atheism or anything like that. It's just kind of find somebody with a, an amazing, interesting, tragic, funny story to tell and give them a, a platform to tell their story. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the short version of okay. what we do. <laughs> yeah, and some of the overlap, I think, with secularism would be that there, it's, you know, the trans community is definitely one of those communities that suffers a lot of backlash from religious communities of different mm -hmm. types. Um, obviously, there are some people within religion that are very accepting and open, but there are many people who are not. And a lot of times the religious intrusion into the state uh, comes in the form of legislation that uh, makes life difficult for people, sometimes infringes on people's rights, and you deal with some of that as well. Yeah, one of the things that I like to say is that secular activism is kind of LGBT activism by proxy, because really the only argument that you ever hear with legislation that's meant to restrict marriage equality, that's meant to restrict, uh, uh, that's meant to, like anti-discrimination laws and that kind of stuff, the argument is always, this is what God says, therefore, and if, uh, and, and if we remove that as a valid argument and say, like, well, it, it doesn't matter what God says because that's not how our laws are supposed to be written, that's not how our society is supposed to be organized, then you're, you're kind of automatically building a wall that protects LGBT people by making those arguments by proxy. And so that's where a lot of the overlap comes. And the other overlap, honestly, is that, uh, you know, I was an atheist from, like, 16 or 17, and my journey was very much like, I read the Bible, didn't make a lot of sense, so I'm an atheist. I, I don't really have a story so much. But when I started going to cons and talking to people and finding out that there's a lot of overlap in coming out as an atheist and coming out as queer or trans, like, they're not exactly the same thing, but uh, people lose family, people lose jobs, people lose their social circles. And so I, I think there's, a, there's a, a sort of special level of empathy that can, be, uh, that can be had between folks coming out as atheist or secular and uh, folks coming out as queer or trans. So th that's, th there are lots of ways in which those things intersect, and that's kind of, um, that's kind of where, where we sit on the show and the, the, where the conversations are that we tend to have. Yeah, and we talked, I think, a little bit about, um, like yesterday we were able to have some conversations, and one of the issues that we discussed was sort of the overall very conservative Christian model of relationships, family, oh, yeah. gender, how things are very simplistic, very binary, man, woman, family, children, nuclear. <laughs> 
right. only option. And just about anything that deviates from that, right? So if somebody doesn't want to have children, there's a problem there, got to restrict birth control, got to restrict abortion and access. If somebody uh, wants to have a, you know, a, a gay relationship, that's a problem because it's not the man and woman, it's not what God intended. It's just any group that sort of bucks that Christian religious model is automatically on the outs. Yeah, well, and some of us can't win because I, I thought about this in a con conversation with a family member who is uh, who's a very, very conservative Pentecostal. And I, I thought, so there, there are a couple of relationship models that I could end up in, and some of them she would accept for bad reasons, and some of them she would reject for bad reasons. So for example, uh, I, as a trans woman, if I ended up in a relationship with a man, she wouldn't accept that because in her mind that's a gay relationship. Right. If I end up in a relationship with another woman, a cis woman, a cisgender woman, she would accept that, but she accepts it because she doesn't see me as who I am. Right. So it's acceptance, but for a really messed up reason. Right. And so it, it builds this, like you said, these models where like, if you don't fit this very, very strict, very strict set of guidelines, then you're wrong and yeah. you, you can't, you can't be valid. And I think the thing that really is the problem here is that, you know, certainly they're, they're capable of holding a perspective that it's wrong. They're capable of holding whatever perspective they want. But I think the issue is when they start to legislate that only what they accept as acceptable is what's going to be legally allowable. Yeah. And, and I've, I've heard people say, things that I, I can at least have a certain level of respect for. Well, they'll say, you know, this is my morality. This is what I believe is correct morality. But I understand that what my morality is doesn't necessarily get to dictate what the laws are. And, you know, it's a different conversation at that point. But I can have at least a certain level of respect for that point of view as opposed to, well, this is what I think is right. Therefore, nobody else is allowed to do anything else. Right, because I think all of us are going to have disagreements with regard to what might be best or what might be correct or what might be... Um, appropriate behavior to have toward other people, but that doesn't mean that we're immediately going to run out and pass laws right. abolishing or banning everything that we don't agree with. Yeah, well, and, and that's so much of the argument you hear is that you, the, the folks on the left are authoritarians on this, on this kind of issue, and I'm like, well, that just demonstrates to, you that you, demonstrates to me that you don't understand my position, because my position is if there is consent and honesty involved, I don't care what you do. You know, if, if you want to have a relationship with 10 or 15 people of all genders and you don't want to have kids, you do want to have, like, I don't care. As long as everybody is informed, mm -hmm. there's honesty and consent, I don't care. Like, I don't know that there could be a less authoritarian position than that. Right, right. Like, there's not a big uprising in the trans community to pass laws disallowing me from using a particular bathroom. Right. And we're not <laughs> trying to force people onto hormones or anything like right. that. Like, I just want to be able to access this stuff. Yeah. No one's trying to dictate to me from the trans community my gender. Right. So I don't know why this is so hard for them to simply accept that, you know. Well, because you're the right one. You're the right, you're the right <laughs> identity. But I, but I guess I look at it like they can, they can choose to live and to view this however they want to, and nobody's forcing it onto them. But mm -hmm. they see just the fact of other people's existence, of the existence of atheists, of gay people, of trans mm -hmm. people, of you know, all kinds of things. I mean, in, in the past, it would have been um, by like interracial, right? Right. It would have been the issue, and so it's just this idea of you don't fit the model. And I think part of the problem is, I mean, we there was an article recently where. Um, they wanted to pass some uh, regulation on not validating trans people. I, we talked about it a little bit on GB right. yesterday. Yeah. And it was very weird. It, they, they literally inserted God into the dialogue. So this is legislators basically saying we're doing this because God. And one of the things that was just, well, all, all of it was disturbing, I guess. But yeah. I, I just found it so unbelievable the way that this... This matters to them to that yeah. degree. And the thing that kind of blew my mind about it is if I'm, if I'm remembering the story correctly, they weren't actually passing any laws or anything. It was just a resolution saying, like, we as a legislative body are making this statement about our morality. Yeah. Like, that it wasn't even actually a law. So it was, I mean, they took time and taxpayer money to just say, like, well, this is, this is where our moral values stand. Yeah. But like, they, they were in opposition to things that they felt, uh, I guess, validated. Yeah, the trans perspectives, or you know, was it were accepting policies that were accepting of that they were against, right. and one of like the, the issue to me 
in that case is that what they're, they're literally saying that they have this model. What, one of the things that they are opposed to is, for example, the um, sex assignment surgery. Mm -hmm. And what's mind-blowing is I read an article where somebody was talking about that and they were saying, oh, I don't know about, the, you know, the ethics of this is still debated was part of the statement that they were using. Like, the, eth the ethics is still debated with the medical community. <sighs> and I thought, and yet, where were you when children were being sexually assigned yeah. and they can't even consent? And we were doing this, and there were very few voices, uh, you know, opposing this. Mm -hmm. And it was routine for a doctor to just, here's an intersex child, indeterminate sex, you're just choosing a gender, you're applying it to this child without any consent. And then later in life, we found that these children had all kinds of problems. Yeah, well, and, and if you look at all of the data that's available, and it's not as well studied as some subjects are, but there is plenty of data out there. And if memory serves, the number of people who end up regretting taking steps to transition is like two or three percent. And usually, it has more to do with the fact that medical science isn't quite advanced enough to get people to the level that they want to get to, or that they take steps to transition. Usually, trans women, uh, begin to be seen as women by society and understand what a tough road that is in mm -hmm. some ways. There was a reporter that, if memory served, worked for ESPN and, and, and just tried to do her job as a woman post-transition and found that the environment was so hostile that she transitioned back and eventually ended up committing suicide. It's a really, really sad story. But it had nothing to do with the fact of her not actually being who she was. It was that the world made things so difficult for her. She had to make the calculation of... Is it, is it more worth it to take the abuse I get for being myself or to just go back to being, just going back to pretending to being someone I'm not? And that's the position that a lot of folks are forced into. And whenever anybody talks about uh, the, the high prevalence of like, depression or anxiety, for example, in the trans community or the, the prevalence of attempted suicide, mm -hmm. people point back to this and say, well, like, well, that's because you know inherently that these things are wrong, that you being trans, it's creating such a cognitive dissonance in your head that you can't stand it. I'm thinking in my mind, like, what if we apply these same arguments to gun rights, right? So, for example... I bring a gun into my home and my children get a hold of it and, and accidentally one of them gets shot and I say, I regret I ever brought that gun into my house. And somebody right. says, well, then we should ban guns. Right. right. Nobody should be able to own a gun because you had right. this incident that made you regret bringing a gun into the house. Um, that's not how it works. I mean, right. e no matter where you stand on gun rights, that's an awful argument. Right, it's just a terrible <laughs> argument. Like, even so, if you end up on the right side of the argument from whatever perspective, right. it's just it, bad. Yeah, nobody should think that that's a good argument to make. Yeah. Um, and the other one that you were just describing, what was the, oh, about, um, uh, I'm not I'm sure I remember. You, the regret was one, but then you brought up another point, and it reminded me, of, I was like, oh, there could be a parallel gun argument there. I don't remember. Like, and a parallel bad gun, right. gun ownership <laughs> argument. But, but yeah, you, these are... These are really not reasons why we deny people. Like, like why, we don't pass laws against things because sometimes people regret it. There are plenty of people who have woken up the next day from a, from a binge saying, right. wow, you know, I am not feeling well. I really regret drinking. And we don't say, okay, it's time to reimpose prohibition. All right. And I mean, <laughs> right? People, people end up with regrets from cosmetic surgery that, or plastic surgery that's entirely cosmetic and superficial, right? Mm -hmm. If, you know, someone has breast augmentation and, oh my gosh, they're too big, nobody takes the leap and says, well, we shouldn't let people do that anymore, right? right? right. And, and the hoops that trans people have to go through are far greater than the hoops that anyone has to go through for anything like that. You know, the day you turn turn 18, you sign a couple of forms and you can get breast augmentation if you want to. But if you're trans, it's you have to have letters and you have to see two different psychiatrists or psychologists mm -hmm. and you, the, the, the barriers that you have to jump through are so much higher just because it has, has something to do with you being trans. Right. And, uh, and, you know, I, and I get like we live in a litigious society, people want to cover themselves, I get that, but <clears throat> Society makes trans people jump through barriers that it largely does not make anyone else jump through yeah. because it's related to gender transition. This is similar to, um, I mean, it's much, uh, this is a much smaller issue, not, not what, compared to what you're describing, but it's, it's very similar for people who decide early in life not to have children. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to have children. I would like to go and, and have surgery to make sure that I am sterilized. Mm -hmm. Finding a doctor that will agree to that to, for someone that, at a young age is near impossible. Right. What if your husband wants kids? Yeah. 
Like, you're, so you're assuming I'm going to have a husband. <laughs> right. You're assuming that I care what he thinks about what I do with my body. What if you change and, your mind later? It's right. like, it's kind of up to me, right? I mean, yeah. and I'm the one that's making that decision. And it all comes back to bodily autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. It's And especially when it comes to... Now, don't get me wrong. It, it is an issue of bodily autonomy, but I do want to say that when it comes to bodily autonomy and surgeons having ethical concerns, I do understand the ethical concerns sure. of a surgeon or a medical community. And I respect that far more than the ethical concerns of legislators who just want to interfere. Right. So when a doctor is explaining, you know, when they know, hey, a lot of people maybe aren't into kids, but then later in life they're more into kids. And mm -hmm. I've seen women who are older now fighting it to, for fertility right. because they didn't have children younger. And so I understand that doctor issuing the warnings. Right. But it's like you're saying, at some point you have to just say, you have been made aware of right. the 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 risks that are associated with this, and you are still deciding to do this. And mm -hmm. here's where you sign to say that you are okay doing this so that later it's not on me. Right, and that's informed consent. And that's you know the model that a lot of uh, doctors use for prescribing hormones for trans folks now. Mm -hmm. It's, okay, I'm trans, I wanna go on estrogen, I wanna go on testosterone, whatever. You sign some paperwork mm -hmm. saying, okay, I know what this is gonna do to my body, I understand the consequences, and right. then you get a prescription, right? Yeah. And it's just like getting medication for literally anything else. Mm -hmm. They have to tell you, okay, here's what the medication does, here's what the side effects are, sign a couple of papers, and you're good. Right. But what's funny, though, is that when you look at the other side of it, right, with, when it comes to the fertility issue, right, you have tons and tons of doctors working on brand new and better ways to provide fertility to people mm -hmm. in a world with a growing population where we're, we're, not, <laughs> we're not stopping anytime mm -hmm. soon. And even with and they, while they still have to consent to, to any kind of surgery like anybody would, mm -hmm. the, the medical community bends over backwards to service that community, make sure that they're able to have kids, even though there are people who have children who say, I regret that I had kids. Right. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. So, a couple of people regret having kids. Yeah. Guess we can't do that anymore. Why aren't doctors <laughs> saying, look, before I can do this fertility thing, you need to really wait and think about this because there are people who regret having children, it's not the right decision for everybody. There's issues like postpartum depression. I mean, you just don't know what mm -hmm. could happen here. And I don't know if ethically I can help you have this child. Right. No, conversation is <laughs> not going to happen. And again, that brings, you know, that brings religion back into the conversation, right? Because right? so much of much the pressure comes from like... Much easier to have the children. <laughs> right. Have Women exist the children. to bear children. Facilitating <laughs> having children is huge, but you don't want to have children and nobody wants to help you with that. They don't want to give you, help you with uh, sterilization. They don't want you to have access to birth control. They don't want you to have access to abortion. It's like, if you don't want to have kids, you are really... Mm -hmm. on the, in the minority when it comes to, you know, you're on the, you're on the crap end of that, that le legislative stick. Yep. <laughs> All right. Do we have anything else to talk about or? Well, oh. I mean, we've got like, I've got like seven hours of stuff we could talk about, but let's take some calls. All right. Well, let's go for it. So we were good enough to have uh, Stefan help us with our call screening earlier, just kind of testing the phones. And so Stefan is on from Tokyo, Japan. How are you doing today, Stefan? Doing pretty good. How are you? Good. Thank you. You're on with Callie and Tracy today. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that uh, I've been a big fan of the show for a while. And specifically, I like uh, Tracy Harris. I'm a big fan of the way you speak to people <laughs> and just your work in general on the show. Well, thank you. What's on your mind today? So I want to ask, uh, which do you guys think is more harmful to the world, government or religion? And when you say government, what are you talking about? Uh, well, specifically, I want to focus on the Western governments. All the Western governments? Yeah. Do, do you think there's enough overlap um, that there's well, similar as enough? As opposed that, to which governments yeah. that, I mean. I'm just curious if you see enough similarities between all of those. I mean, those we, to, we just spent a few minutes talking about how, for example, the U.S. government is highly influenced by religion uh, and, and, and that our legislation is very often crafted um, with, with huge amounts of religious influence. So even decoupling those two things in the United States is a difficult task. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, okay, let's just focus on the United States government. Okay. So do you do you guys think which do you okay, so do you do you think that the United States government is more harmful to the world than religion? In what regard? Like like harm what are we measuring? And I'm not trying to be pedantic here, I just want to know like is it more harmful when it comes to 
for example? Give me, a, give me an example. Like, let's say, uh, the protecting human life. See, I don't, like, like Tracy said earlier, I don't know that you can separate the two because the, our government, as, as much as systemically it's supposed to be, you know, church-state separation, uh, so much of our government is informed by Judeo-Christian values. So I'm not sure that we can speak of those things as if they're entirely separate. And you, you think there is, there is a separation there, that we can talk about them as two separate entities? Yes, yeah, because, for, okay, so the government... Okay, so the gov government and religion, they're, okay, how can I going to say this? They're both uh, faith-based institutions that are meant to control people. So... I guess I'm yeah. looking at it like these are, these are extremely complex <laughs> situations. So, for example, Let's go back a ways and let's pick like an easy example, something that's a little bit more, I mean, there's no such thing as, there's never gonna be a black and white example, but let's look at World War II, right? We can pretty much all agree that the genocides that were happening in Germany were not acceptable and that, we, and that steps needed to be taken in order to intervene in that. Is that, would we agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Like the genocide of right, the right. Jewish so, people. so it, it's something that really the, the the globe couldn't just sit back and say, well, that's Germany's decision and whatever they're doing, and you know, sure they're marching on Poland and they're invading France, but that's up to France and Poland. I mean, at some point, the world has to say, we're going to take action, and when you have a leader who's not going to listen to um, diplomacy and insists on basically taking, you know, military response, requires military response, you could easily say that knowing when you go in that you're going in for at least in part a humanitarian reason to try and help people and to try and save lives, you are going to necessarily have to kill people and take lives and cause harm. You can't, you can't go in, even if you had the best motives in the world, to simply, what if, even if your complete motivation was we want to liberate these poor people being abused, and I'm not saying that you know, anyone's intentions were that pure, but even if they were, you couldn't do that without causing a great deal of harm. Many people died just in the straight up conflict of trying to battle out this war, even if you don't look at the collateral damage, right, just in soldiers who, who were involved. And so when you're saying, you know, are they causing harm, it's really hard to answer because, yes, a great deal of harm was caused by going into Germany and by, you know, going up against Japan and by going up against, you know, the, the uh, you know, when, when the Axis, the Axis mm -hmm. you, you had to, you're going to have to break eggs to make the omelet. And so... Right. We look at things like that, and then you look at things like, for example, the fighting in Jerusalem, where Kelly is talking about this intersection of religion and government. And can we say that the damage that's being done by escalation and our decisions on how we handle Israel are not contributing to part of the problem and part of the violence that occurs there? And that would be like this weird intersection of religion and government. Um, I, I think that there are some situations where government is going to be more clearly acting in, in, as a government. And, and when you were talking about controlling people, my perspective of government by the people is that we are governing ourselves. And you're right, this necessarily means that we're going to have to exert some controls over the population because otherwise it's chaos. And, and uh, well, and, and I think the other thing to think about is when you ask the question, like going back to what you said about government being a faith-based institution that's meant to control people, and that makes me wonder, I mean, are, are we talking about government as a concept or are we talking about specific implementations of that concept? Um, and, and I don't, again, I, I think we have to examine the question, I think we have to examine the definition a little more closely than that because um, you know, we can talk about the, the governing systems of indigenous peoples versus the government of the United States. And I don't, aside from the fact that uh, we're talking about a, a, peop, a person or a group of people that has authority, I don't know that we can compare those as the same thing as, a, as this nebulous term of yeah. government. I mean, in the end, I feel, 
I, I feel like unable to give you a satisfactory answer to that question because I feel like the question is a simple question to a very complicated issue. I think that government in the United States and government in other countries certainly can be, can, does cause harm and sometimes even causes harm in a quest to do good. Uh, because there's always going to be two sides to everything. You know, someone's going to be imposed upon and harmed in a way whenever you're, you know, serving other, other populations. But in the same way, I mean, religion is integrated into the government and religion causes its own brand of harm. Like Callie was talking earlier about the harm that's perpetrated on the trans community by religious uh, models of relationships and gender and existence of you know this this system that they see as a relationship model that has to be conformed to and anybody that doesn't conform is actively uh, oppressed with them using literally trying to use legislation use the laws use the government in order to enact that so is that religion causing harm or is that government causing harm because it's being used as the tool of religion it's a complicated issue. Right. Yeah. 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 I understand what you're saying. Cool. I guess what I'm saying is, uh, okay, so government, okay, so the U.S. government can can cause good and they can do bad things like the invasion of Iraq or Libya and Syria and like, or just the invasion of the Middle East in general, where they basically killed all these people to steal oil and... They can also do good things like provide social security for their citizens and things like welfare, job security, and stuff like that. But I guess what I'm saying is I feel like I feel like the government are way more of a threat to the human race because of the fact that just this escalation of empire and military conquest has brought us to a point to where if we go any further, we could be talking about nuclear war. And that could very well be the end of our people, of like our entire, of the entire human race. See, I'm not sure that I disagree with pretty much anything you said there, but my, what it comes back to for me is you, you asked this question about the harm of government, and I don't know that any of the things that you described are necessarily outcroppings of the institution of government itself. It's what people have decided they want to do with that institution, not the institution itself. Does that make sense? It does, but the thing is, that the people who are making these decisions, like, it's not the everyday person, like, it's not like I or you or me were like, okay, yeah, let's go into Iraq and kill all these people. Or it wasn't, it was, it was, you know, the... Yeah. I, I'm going to have to say that this is getting far too people. complicated in scope for the yeah. atheist experience. And part of the reason is, I, I think that, that there's a lot that can be done to criticize governance and government. I don't know that a comparison to religious harm is, is actually useful or helpful. I think that we agree that government can be used for as a tool for good or a tool for uh, harm. And I think that religion can be used in some cases as a tool for good, for example, uh, religious charities that are actually helpful mm -hmm. or people who uh, go to liberal churches that yeah. support food banks and things like that. And it can also be guilty of horrible harm like uh, with regards to the oppression that we were talking about earlier. I don't think that we disagree that both institutions are, are capable of being used as a tool for good ends or, or or harmful ends, but I'm not, I'm not sure that this show is the place that we're going to resolve. Um, I, I don't even know that the question of which is worse is resolvable based on our capacity to measure. What do you mean by that? I don't. It's almost like when they say, "Did the Russians affect the election?" <laughs> Right, so if, if, there's no way to measure when you're talking about influence exerted through media. Can we really measure how much somebody was influenced by particular articles that they may or may not have seen? So there's no way to know if they influenced the election. So all we can do is kind of shrug and say that's something we can't measure because we don't have the the skill set and the you know the knowledge to measure a thing like that. And with this. I certainly don't have the skill set to measure, like to go through and tally the harm and the good caused by government, in the US government and religion in the US or globally or whatever we're talking, and then come to some quantitative decision about which is more harmful. I, d I don't have that 
capacity. Yeah, I think no, it I becomes kind of an, an infinite regression of defining concepts. So when we say government, what do we mean by that? When we say religion, what do we mean by that? Because I mean, even that word itself means a million different things depending on who you're talking to. So I, I think what I what I think the issue is that the the scope of the question isn't specific enough to even really be able to have an answer. If that makes sense. No, it does. I just wanted to pick your guys' brain about it a okay. little because fair. <laughs> I mean, well, because the thing is. I don't know. Well, so are, are you familiar with Matt Dillahunty and his? Uh, I have heard of what him. Was it his? <laughs> yeah, but his well, he gave like a presentation about the superiority of secular morality. Okay. And okay, first I have to ask: Would you agree that you have a secular moral system? I, I would say yes. My I mean, my views are informed by my morality and, and the evidence. Yeah, I mean, many, many atheists are yeah. humanists and that would be a secular, uh, a moral system that can be secular. But okay, well, I don't understand how, how, how can you say that your morality is superior but I mean, many atheists. We're, move, wait, we're, uh, we're <laughs> moving into other questions. We have other callers and we've addressed the question that you called to ask. And I understand you have more questions, but the show has a limited time span. So I do have other callers that are waiting, and I don't, I, I'm willing to fully admit that we don't have an answer to the question that you originally posed. And I think before we start getting into the, the list of questions, um, we really have to show some regard for the, for the rest of the callers that are waiting. Does that, I mean, I, I don't. Yeah, I, no, I understand. Okay. Can I call back like next week? Yeah, absolutely, feel free. I think that's a great okay. idea, in fact. Feel free to call back and discuss the moral question. It comes up often, and I think we'd be happy to talk to you about it. But I think today we, we kind of spent a lot of time on, on a question that's unanswerable. And, um, okay. But it was, it's not a bad question. It was just you know, too, maybe too much to chew. So I really appreciate you calling in, Stephen. Or okay, I think it's Stefan. You. Sorry, thank you. No, it's okay. okay thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, so let's move along. Yeah. And we will go to Victor in Brooklyn, New York. Hi, Br uh, you Victor. Doing? You're on with Tracy and Hello. Callie. Hi. What's on your mind today? Um, well, I know you guys have been seeking the, uh, and I watched a lot of your previous shows, and I'm a huge fan, by the way. I was actually uh, an anti theist. I was actually just completely against the notion of God and just never really believed in God my whole life until I realized that. There is a proof for intelligent design and that we're an intelligently designed system. So, uh, I thought I'd definitely just get right to it. <laughs> uh, so we are not on a, a spinning ball spinning at 1,000 miles an hour going we're, around. You're saying we're not on it? No, we are not on a ball. Are we on anything that's like kind of spherical? Right. Okay. We're on a flat motionless oh you're, this is flat earth is this is yes first let me just confirm like you, so you're you're pitching this as a serious call yeah yeah no that's serious <laughs> i know it's hard to believe that there's people like us but you know there's no no believe me we're that, aware uh, i mean there, we're aware that flat earthers exist um, yeah i'm just i'm curious how that's related to intelligent design i'm interested in your your uh, thought process there yeah, so if we're on a flat, motionless plane, right, that throws out gravity because gravity is what makes planets round. If you throw out gravity, the entire Big Bang heliocentric model is completely destroyed. Can we throw out gravity, out gravity, though? Gravity. Well, no, what he's saying huh? is that if the Earth is flat, the, then gra the gravity model would be conflicted with that because gravity is what makes, <laughs> was what rules, right. you know, it, it, to make it more round. Um, and I guess the problem that we're going to have with this is that it's not really established that the Earth is flat. So we're not. I'm well, going no, no. to have difficulty moving beyond that question because the whole well, thing I mean, seems to stem. See the horizon is flat. Um, what I'm saying is that, like, if you use your senses, right, you don't feel anything spinning, and you don't see the curve of the Earth at any altitude. And then you can see the curve of the Earth at certain altitudes, though. Yeah, I, I was on a plane no. to get here, and I saw it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not being smart. I, I, I really, I, I mean, I, I, I travel a lot and I fly a lot and I can see the curvature okay. when I fly. Okay, so 35,000 feet, you can see it, right? That's what you're saying? Generally speaking, I mean, if, if, the, if the cloud level is low and I can see the horizon, I can see a slight curve to it, yeah. Okay, so Neil deGrasse Tyson says that you can't see it at that altitude, so I really This really doesn't matter. We have, we have I'm, satellites I'm, orbiting. I'm Wait, I, I am not, I'm really not prepared to have this conversation because 
right now what we've got is, I mean, you, you cannot deny that this is considered to be an extremely fringe view in light of fields of study that span many aspects of science, right? So this is not right, just well, you, you could, NASA. You, you could tell that to Galileo, and you could tell, let him know why you feel how he feels about that when people told him, like, how we thought that the Earth was round, and then, you know, he was on the fringe and everything, right? So... That's yeah, and, and believe me, if, if, we, if it turns out that, you know, one day this is consensus, I will say, dang, I have to eat my hat. They found, like, you know, some reason to eject, reject, like, a mountains, volumes of evidence in many fields of science in order to, you know, I mean, people fly, we can circumnavigate the globe, and we have satellites orbiting. All of our science that has to do with space is based on our knowledge of physics, which you are saying is just completely and utterly wrong. Gravity doesn't exist, and yet gravity is factored into all these things that we do. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a very complex topic. but It is a complex topic, and I'm not convinced that you're correct, and your arguments are not going to convince me that you're correct, because the correct people well, to I, convince... Well, I that because you have a belief. Because you have a belief. No, I, I, this is not about a belief. belief. This is about a scientific consensus right, that I am not involved in. I'm saying that if you would like to change my mind, you will have to go to the relevant scientific fields and change their mind. Show them your evidence, show them your reasoning, and convince them why they're wrong. And then when that well, can they- happen, I will say, wow, you have convinced the people who are best educated in this field, who have access to the best evidence, and, and uh, Victor in Brooklyn talked to them, presented whatever his ideas were and convinced them to reconsider this idea of a round or spherical Earth. And when that occurs, I'm not the person to convince, right? I'm not the person that dictates the shape of the Earth to to science texts, books, and curricula. You need to talk to those people because until they're... Debating, like we're just there's no like debate I'm not here. Anti, I'm not anti, <laughs> there's there's not a debate. debate. Yeah. I'm saying that I am willing to go with the consensus of science because it's based on the prevailing evidence, and the best, most educated minds in the fields involved are saying that they accept that model. I'm simply saying that if you want to see change in that model, if you want to have a debate about the model, talk to the people who are promoting that model, right? Because to me, that model. Whether, whatever, whatever model they throw out is got nothing to do with a god. And so when, when you can, if, if you really have uh, problems with that model, go talk to the people that are, that are, that are in charge of supporting and making well, that the like, prevailing model. Well, and yeah, I, I think the important like, thing to keep in mind is that uh, not only do you have to demonstrate that what your belief is is true, you also have to demonstrate why everything that we know that's based on that foundational knowledge of the Earth being round, why does all of the stuff we do that assumes that work so well, even with that being wrong? Like, it, you're okay, so okay, far well, away from... If I can yeah, get go a ahead. chance to talk. Okay, so if... Okay, what you're saying is, you, when, you, when you tell somebody that the Earth is round and it's spinning, you're telling me something that's going against my senses, right? That's why the people in the past believed that the Earth was flat, because they go outside and they see that it's flat, and they don't feel anything spinning, so they just thought that the Earth was flat. So if you're going to tell me that it's round and it's spinning, you need to prove that to me with evidence, with empirical... And, and that's been done evidence. pretty conclusively. Yeah, you, you can open no any Earth science for book for a sixth-grade classroom, and there it is. And I, I, what I'm well, saying... Well, a picture of the Earth? No, not a picture of the Earth, but the explanations for it. And what I'm well, saying, gravity. what I'm saying is, if if you really take issue with scientific models of the shape of the Earth, can I ask you how many times you've reached out to, for example, the people who are who work on this model and and ask them to review your thoughts? Well, I was just on a previous uh, atheist call and show. Just I'm now. not talking about atheists. atheists. I'm talking yeah. about the people who. Like have produced this model. Geologists. Yeah. Well, there was an aerospace engineer on the show, and, and she said that uh, it was all orbital mechanics. Well, if you're going to use that, then I could say, you know, triangular mechanics. Okay, but wait a minute. You're still triangle, talking about the atheist mechanics. show. And, and yes, I, I respect that Jen has a degree in aerospace engineering. I believe that's what her degree is in. Um, but what I'm saying is there are universities with departments that you can contact and you can talk to them about this. And I'm asking you, have you ever reached out to the scientific community that is, in, you know, that, that is actually responsible for this model and tried to talk to somebody about your ideas? Well, I would like to, but that's not like, like you, you're using this type of argument just to try to like 
No, no I'm no, I'm sincerely I, I wondering. Minority. You are you are in the minority, and you're you're going to call and try to convince me that you're right. And what I'm saying is, I'm the wrong person no, to, I'm convince. Trying to convince you. Well, you are though. You said, I think you that's said, disingenuous I know, of I you. I'm not trying to convince you. I know because I, I listen. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I know that's not going to happen. What I'm trying, I'm just trying to throw the idea out there because listen, if you would tell me this a few years ago, I would also look at you like you're crazy. But the thing is, you need to do the research yourself. And when you do the research, you'll find out that you cannot debunk the flat Earth. And when you go flat, you can't go back. Have <laughs> you talked Earth to researchers flat. in this area? You're also assuming that we haven't done the research and done the reading. Like you're assuming that because our position disagrees with yours, that we haven't done the research. And I and I would say that's a that's a pretty bad assumption to move forward on. Right. Okay. I mean, I could. You know, Whereas we're asking you, project. and you're making assumptions about our position and what we're doing is we're asking you. Yeah, I mean, this is like, geography. Yeah. This is cosmology. This is, I mean, this is so many areas of science that are, that somehow, like, like what Kelly was saying, somehow mo the model works, even though you're saying it is completely wrong. I don't know what to say to you other than calling atheists to talk to them about your concepts of how the well, world, I, <laughs> like earth science, Well, it, I don't understand I'm that. Calling, I'm calling because, I, like I said before, I wasn't an atheist. I was even more of an atheist. I was an anti-theist of the Christopher Hitchens type of atheist where I said, no, there is no God. And I loathe the existence of I just absolutely never believed in a God until I came to this realization. So if we, some, something is going to prove to me that there is a some type of or form of creator or intelligent designer, then that would have to be a really huge proof for me because I was even more extreme than you guys. What is intelligent so about a flat, a flat planet? Atheism. Excuse me? What's intelligent about flat planets? No, the planets are not. I don't, I don't know what shape the planets are. They're circular. I don't, know, I don't know if they're a sphere. I don't know if they're even physical. They're probably just all the stars. That's what I would say. Wait, so that you're, you're saying that you're not a flat earther? No, I, am a I think he's talking about other planets. We don't. We can't say the same about other planets, but we know. <laughs> so other planets, planets right, fit listen, the model listen, of even, gravity, but not the Earth. Even the even, what? <laughs> I, I I'm just not. I mean, this isn't even. I don't even. This is absolutely. Yeah. Out there, I. If listen, if the, if the stars and the sun and the moon are orbiting over us and the Earth is flat, then it is absolutely 100 percent evidence that it is intelligently designed. Because there's no way that you can say that. All of this stuff, all of the things in the cosmos, they're all revolving all around us for us. And it's Wait a like, minute. Even if everything revolved around us, how can you say it revolves for us? Because this sun and the moon are orbiting over just the planet Earth, over just the Earth, right? So it's for us. It's there. Why do you think it's for us? Just because something is doesn't mean it's for me. If there's a rock sitting outside in the in the parking lot, is that rock for me because it's like in proximity because I see it or it's near me or... I mean, oh, no, what makes you think exact, it's for that's me? A false analogy. Why? That's, 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 that's a great analogy. analogy. If, if just because something yeah. is doesn't mean it's for somebody. Like we're gonna go out to eat for dinner after this, and if I didn't go out to eat for dinner, like that food still exists. That food doesn't exist for me. It just exists and happens to benefit me if I make a certain set of decisions. Like or or if or if a certain set of circumstances come together. Like that. Yeah. That that doesn't follow at all. I mean, the sun gives all life on Earth. The moon is, you know... The, yeah, is, isn't that a happy system. coincidence? Why, why coincidence do you, is a thing, yeah. Why do you think oh, that, that, that's, that, that that's an intentional thing? Where is your evidence that that's by, intentional? By the stars, the, everything is revolving for us and that the Earth is flat, and then that means that... No, the, you don't get to just say that everything Earth. revolves for us. Like, where are you getting this? Because it's revolving around us. What do you mean? Even if it's, it's revol even if you had a flat Earth. Earth that the stars all revolved around, where are you getting that that's an intentional thing for for people? Yeah, like that's a leap. I think <laughs> like, even where from, the heck did you even connect you, that? Like if you were to convince me of a flat Earth, that's still a huge leap to say that it all exists specifically for our benefit. Well, I, I don't think it's really a wild assumption to think that if the sun and the moon and, and every single star in the sky is revolving around us, that you would just think that that would have to be there. Something the has to be the center of the universe. Something has to be the center of the universe. Something has to be the center of the universe. Just because you are in it, 
if you were the center of the universe, it doesn't, I mean, I know that's a, that's a funny little human phrase that we use about I'm the center of the universe, but really, even if there's some point has to be the center of the universe, right? I mean, or could be the center of the universe. It doesn't, doesn't mean that, that whatever is the center of the universe, that's what it's for. So even in the models that we have currently, let's say that we have a finite, you know, boundaries around the universe. I don't know that this is accurate, but let's say that, that the models that we have now with a round Earth um, dictate that the center of the universe is elsewhere. Do you think that we think that means that the universe is for that point? That's ridiculous. Well, you're just saying that the universe is just this giant, huge, you know, near infinite thing, and then it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> what the heck does it the, matter? What's in the middle or yeah. what's in the, what's one inch from the left boundary? I mean, who cares? How is that relevant to anything? Right, what I'm saying is that the Earth is everything. This is my Earth is not no, everything. That is, most, that is most certainly not true. The okay. Earth is not everything. You get to take this up at the, the blog. Is the, is the, take it up at the blog, the Victor. Take it up at the blog. Go to the blog. <laughs> post your, your evidence or whatever it is you want to post because well, this I is really actually, not... But they didn't approve my comment. They didn't approve me on the site or something. I, I approve any comment that appears to be a comment posted in good faith. I'm not the only moderator at the blog, but as long as something appears to be a legitimate response to the show and it's not like some kind of weird, vile thing, which I don't think you would be posting, um, I would generally approve that. I can say that you can try again and see where that gets you or maybe even use a different email address if you have it. I have no objection to you posting this at the blog. In fact, I think this is the, the venue for it because then people can actually respond. But I, I really, this... Um, you know, when, when the answer is just, just because it's for us, because we're in the center, therefore it's for us, I don't even know what to do with that. We have other callers. I'm moving along. Thank you, Victor. Okay, so now we have Andrew in Twinsburg, Ohio. Uh, hi, Andrew. You're on with Callie and Tracy. Hey, Tracy. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm pretty good. Uh, just to respond to that previous caller, the book of Isaiah written in 700 B.C., it says that the earth is round. So, well, I I say, Yeah, if he believes in God, then yeah. So, yeah. And I still don't get why it matters for him, but okay. <laughs> but uh, I guess I wanted to uh, prove uh, Genesis. Uh, that's the first book of the Bible, so that's the most important book. That's the most Because it's first? Book. Is that like we're, it, because we're in the center? <laughs> well, it's not written for. Well, yeah. Well, uh, I wanted to talk about Noah's Ark. Okay. Uh, just I wanted to start with something in Genesis Genesis six three here. It says that after the flood, no man will live past one hundred twenty years, which is very uh, amazing since no man after the flood has lived to be one hundred twenty years. The oldest man that ever lived was a Japanese man who lived to be one hundred. And how do we know that anybody? How do we yeah. know that anybody ever lived past 120 years? And and why does well, specifically what the Bible have to say about that? What, like what what is that? I mean, if about? I wrote a book and said no one is ever going to be 15 feet tall after after this time, and I claim that there used well, to be people that were 15 feet tall, would you say like, wow, how did they know that there wouldn't be any 15 foot tall people 2,000 years later? Yeah, but I just think it's amazing with all the scientific discoveries that no man has lived to be over 120 but there was a woman that lived to be 122 in france but but that's a woman in uh, genesis and they matter less man. as we know it doesn't say man. right but i i'm not convinced that uh people were living as long as the bible claims before that was written yeah i, I think you would have to demonstrate i think that the, the idea that is that first. you have a myth that basically is claiming that people live to be you know 900 years old or whatever 500 years old and then they said, "Oh, but this doesn't gonna, this doesn't happen anymore." And it's like I'm claiming that it never did happen. Yeah, that, that well, we have no evidence uh, that well, it happened. Well, I wanted to start with just a little bit of evidence about the oceans. Okay. Uh, the, the Pacific Ocean is really huge. It's huge. It's 165 million square kilometers. So, the entire, all the continents of the Earth could fit inside the Pacific Ocean. And uh, when you're looking at the average land elevation of the world, it's around 2,756 feet. So that's about half a mile. And when you just look at the depth of the uh, Pacific Ocean, the average depth is about 14,000 feet, and the max depth is uh, Mariner's Trench is about five miles deep. So there was – there because that's the question atheists always ask. They go, where did the water go? Well, it went to the ocean. I'm not sure that's a, a a discussion that I've heard a lot 
in the. I, I've, well, I don't even <laughs> ask it because yeah. I don't believe there ever was a global flood. So I don't. I don't. I'm not asking where did the water go. I'm saying just prove that there was actually a global flood, uh, or even if there was a global flood, prove that the stories that are in the Bible about it are correct. Prove All that right, it happened because correct. of a forty day and night rain. Prove that you know what I mean. This it, I don't. I don't understand the relevancy. Like even if we had had a global flood at some point, which, you know, it is funny because if the entire earth was covered with water, I do understand the question of like, how come it's not still covered with water? But the point is, so what? So, so let's say that what we look at the science and there was a global flood and, you know, later on we had these myths that talked about it, just like people in along river areas write about their floods. So they wrote these myths about a flood and, and so what? Well, it's the uh, Hebrew word is mabu, and that means it was a global flood because there's a lot of creationists. Okay, I, I'm, just saying, I'm just saying, let's say that you, despite the fact that we could get into an argument about whether or not there was a global flood, let's just say for the sake of your argument that there was a global flood and the, that mm -hmm. somehow the water then redistributed into the oceans and that there was the Hebrews who wrote, um, wrote down some myths about this, so what? Well, that's that's the if you if you're a Christian, you got to prove Genesis first. So, proving Noah's Ark is pretty difficult, but I'm trying. So, well, I I don't I don't necessarily think that that's true because there there are, I have a lot of Christian friends who don't take Genesis literally, and sure. they they call it parables. And so, I'm not sure that I accept your premise that you have to prove Genesis. Yeah, to you be absolutely a don't. Yeah. But if you want to to you know go that route, I, it's not relevant to whether or not there's a God. Um, but I, I I mean even if even if events occurred, it doesn't mean that a God was driving it. Well, I disagree with that. That's what, so. So what's your evidence? I don't know. That, that, that's what we're, because you give a lot of statistics. Well, right. uh, the record for the most amount of rainfall in one minute is in Maryland in July 4th, 1956. It rained 1.22 inches in one minute. Let me try this again. Now, Let's but, assume for the sake of your argument that there was historically a global flood. And that later, Correct. some people wrote some myths about it. So what? The, um, I, I don't have the artifact right in, in front of me, but I believe it's called the Weld Blondell Prism. They found this prism, and it has basically a bunch of Sumerian kings, and it has basically, after the flood, all their ages drop dramatically. You you lost me on the relevance because because <laughs> again we're, you, what what Tracy asked is okay we accept for the for the purposes of this discussion we accept that a global flood happened our question is okay so what L let's assume there was a global flood how do you prove that a god caused that well who else would cause a global flood <laughs> that's not answering the question though no. yeah where, where where is the evidence that a god would be behind such a thing it, especially because we know. Uh, on natural disasters on a smaller scale than a global flood, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, all that. We, we understand yeah. decently well the natural mechanisms for those. So why would we not assume that there was a natural mechanism for that? Why would we jump to, well, this is special enough that it had to have been a god. It couldn't just be the natural mechanism. Yeah, is every understand. flood caused by a god? Are regional floods caused by lesser gods? Well, I believe God is sovereign. So uh, to answer your question, yes. Yeah. Okay, so then the real question isn't really about whether or not a flood occurred. Like, let's just say that there's a flood in Tennessee, and you're saying that God is behind that flood. We can just talk about that flood. What makes you think there's a God behind that flood? That, I guess that's an interesting question, but to for a, a global flood to occur, you'd have to believe it's some kind of supernatural. No, you wouldn't. No, you don't at all. No, you wouldn't. No, not at all. So I would simply, I would have an event. Flood. Wait a minute. I would just have an event that was like a global flood where the water de redistributed into these, into these other areas that became the oceans. And even if it was counterintuitive to scientific models, the, the answer to that would be, wow, that's a really weird incident that we currently can't explain. We don't know what caused it. You're saying that you do, you do accept that a god is the cause of that, and I'm asking you where you're getting that. Well, As opposed you to you don't know. Job, Sorry. Well, if you look at the book of Job, that is according to most creation scientists, the oldest book in the Bible. And it says that, and it says something about under, let me see here. 
Well, says, my question is, is what, why is it relevant what the Bible says? What we're asking for is, is actual evidence of your position. You can point to, I mean, I, I can point to any book that says anything. So then I, I guess we regress a little further and say, we, before you can present what is in the Bible as evidence, you yeah. have to prove to me that it's relevant because evidence. Because, for example, let's say the Wall Street Journal covers a flood in Tennessee. I don't point to that and say, whoa, God. Because yeah, look, the, the Wall Street Journal wrote about it and it really happened. I think what a lot of this comes back to is our perspective, because in for, from our perspective, a global flood is a really big freaking deal, right? But if we look at the scale of the universe, a global flood, that's small potatoes, that's not really that big of a deal. Literally anything having to do with the Earth is insignificant on a cosmic scale. So, you know, we can look at the formation of stars and black holes and all these cosmic concepts. Like, why are we appealing to a global flood instead of those? And I think that has a lot to do with our limited perspective as beings that exist on the planet. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious why the fixation on that specific event as well. So many questions. Well, I guess we can go back to the beginning of Genesis if you want to. Well, I'm not super interested in that, though. Well, no, I'm but if we go back to the beginning of Genesis, right, in the beginning, God created. Yeah. And so my question is, where is the evidence God is responsible for anything? Where is the evidence because that God exists in, and causes anything? Well, in the Old Testament, is go. I believe there's 12 verses in all, all the Old Testament books that God, that he spread out the heavens. Okay, so let's, if you look at let's the, wait, the Bible says God did a lot of stuff, and you're saying God does everything. And so my question is, where is where do we have evidence that a God exists and that God is causing stuff? I, th I think the, the, the better way to phrase the question is, can you demonstrate the truth of anything you believe without referencing the Bible? That's fair enough. So can well, you? It was science that discovered that the universe was expanding, and uh, I believe in the 20s, Hubble did. But the Bible knew that already thousands of years before. Even if that were true, why does that matter? Because that's very, that's, how did they know that? How do you know they knew it? People guess things right all the time. <laughs> right, there's all kinds of cosmologies on the planet. Just because you had one that had something right, and I'm not even saying it did, I'm just saying for the sake of argument, let's say that out of all the, the hundreds and thousands of cosmologies that cultures have come up with, um, somebody said something that seems to match what actually was later discovered to be true. Is it just the, <laughs> the capacity of, of a culture to come up, like hit, they hit that lucky point? But I don't even think that it necessarily would be that lucky because there's nothing that specific in the Bible. Well, yeah, and that's my science. question is, is there any of it that's not like the Nostradamus thing where it's like you look at some very vague words that he used and said, oh gosh, he predicted 9-11. Like almost everything that I've heard in the Bible where they say like, oh, they knew this ahead of time. Yeah. It, was, it was more like, they said, you know, this thing will happen yeah, the, the, during the in daytime. Fact, and, in fact, if you want to see scientific claims uh, claimed for a holy book, you can't get any bigger than Muslims in the Quran. Like, they, they have, like, just loads and loads of scientific facts that they say the Quran contains and, and that it was aware of, like, way before. And, and to me, when you go and read it, it it's not really specific. It, it doesn't really, it's, it's, you, people are going back and reading it that way. Well, I think Genesis is very specific. For example, look at uh, God created light before the sun. There's different forms of electromagnetic radiation. There's x-rays, there's radio waves. Of course, there was light. If you believe in the Big Bang, you believe that there was light before the sun. Yeah, but what I'm saying is just because they wrote that, you know, God created light and then later he creates the sun and the moon, and then you say, wow, we know that there were other sources of light than the sun, right? They knew there were other sources of light beside the sun, too, because they saw, for example, stars, and they may, may not have known that the moon was reflective, and so they saw the moon as a source of light. So they saw other, well, the, the moon would have been later as well, but like stars, for example, were visible to those people, and they know they're a source of light, right? Fire. So. I mean, they understand that light comes from more than the sun, so I, I just don't know why you would look at that myth and, and sort of look for, you're painting a target around the arrow, right? So you're saying like, this is, there's where the arrow hit, let's, let's go back and paint the target around it and then say it was right. We don't really know what they were talking about. This is an ancient myth, it, who knows what they meant when they said God created light and dark and you know, what, what were they describing? I have no idea. And, and I don't think that you can say that you really have an idea, too. You just simply look at, what, at certain scientific models and you say, oh, I think I can match it up to that. Well, yeah, sure, you could do that with, with any holy book, What's, but that doesn't demonstrate a god. 
true, but we can only look at the evidence that's presented to us. So, right. so where is it? We, aside we from, aside from the Bible, where is it? Well, I, the Bible's the claim, and I'm trying to demonstrate that. I guess that's my point. But you keep referring back to the claim to demonstrate the claim. So that's I'm I'm not understanding where where you make the leap. I understand. I don't so, know where you want to go from this. <laughs> what, what, I, I, it comes back to my question of can you point to something other than the Bible to demonstrate the truth of what uh, you're... All right. The, most, of the water, most of the water in the flood came from the springs of the great deep. So like geysers, if you look at Old Faithful and uh, Yellowstone, that's what reminds me of the global flood. I guess what you're trying to do, though, is say that there's this book and it has some things written in it, and I think some of those things correspond to reality. And I'm saying there are tons of books that have things in them that correspond to reality. I don't think that it proves that a God exists. So let's just, for the sake of argument, we'll give you that, too. You have this book. It has things that are, you know, describe realities. Um, so where is, where is the demonstration that a God is behind any of these realities, that a God is behind this book? Where is your demonstration of that, that a God exists? I understand. It, 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 it's a worldview. If I, I, I look at something and you look at it different, I, under, I, I, I understand that. But, but what, if what, I look at... What we're asking, though, is, is for you later. to provide right. evidence of that. We agree upon these realities. Right? We agree on the realities. We may have some disagreements about whether or not the book accurately describes those realities. I'm saying I don't care if it does accurately describe them or not, even though I don't think it does, because even if you had a book that accurately described these realities in a way that we couldn't understand, we'd have a book that we don't understand that is offering up you know, something that, oh, you know, how, how did they know that? Let's say it described in detail, like a cosmology that we've, we later came to find evidence for, and it was very robust. I guess the question then would be, we still don't know that a God is responsible for that. We don't know what would be responsible for that. We'd have to investigate to discover what was responsible for that, wouldn't we? Uh, correct. So what I'm thinking well, of what is... What you're looking at is, how is God behind this? I, I think there would have to be an existent God to, to have a God be responsible for any of it. And so at the end of the day, if we're going to, we can list causes. We can list a, a million things that you believe God is responsible for. And my question is, if there is no God, then God is not responsible for it. If there is a God, he may or may not be, or that God may or may not be responsible for it. But the first step would be, can we at least demonstrate that there is a God that um, has the capacity to do these things and would want to do them? and did them, <laughs> right? Like, yes, it, sir. So, that, that, no, no, it, it's, not, it's not the easiest thing to prove now with art, so. I, I mean, even if there was a big boat. I, 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 I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> even, like, <laughs> let's, I, I think, Where's even if God? we, if we accept that there's a global flood, we accept that there was a Noah's Ark, and all of that, I still don't, understand how that would get you to God. Because yeah. I, I keep thinking, like, let's say I read a book and there are some super eerie similarities between that story and my life story. What I think of is, huh, that's an interesting coincidence. I don't think, oh, this person was predicting my life story. Right, and you know? because the people writing the myth, if they were writing a myth about a flood and a boat and whatever, and then they ascribe it to their particular God based on their religious beliefs of that culture at that time that put down that record, it doesn't mean that they're correct in what they're assuming is the cause, even if they were describing accurately the events. That's fair. Right? So you're an atheist right. now, right? No, I don't, I don't I'm <laughs> not saying that you're an atheist. Um, I, I will say that I, I think that this is another good one for the blog. I don't know if you've ever posted to our, our blog, the Atheist Experience blog. Um, if you go to our homepage, there's a link to it on the left-hand side. And I think that this would be another issue where maybe back and forth um, with your ideas on this and maybe other people kind of questioning it. Because I don't, I feel like at this point I'm doing a disservice because I'm just repeating myself and in asking the same question, you know, like where's yeah. the evidence there's a God behind it? It's, it's not even a, and even when I give that, oh, hey, let's just say these events occurred so that we don't have to argue about the events. Where's the evidence that it's a God causing it? I think that's the crux of it. I would say put a, put a little bit of thought into that question and then maybe go post at the blog when you've had a little bit of time to ruminate about this and see if, if other people maybe have other ideas about it and maybe somebody will um, you know be, be even supportive I don't know
All right. I appreciate you taking my call. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Take care. Uh, Bye. Yeah. Okay, let's try uh, Samantha in Asheville, North Carolina. Hi, Samantha. You're on with Callie and Tracy. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, okay. Wow. I can't, I waited so long. I can't even believe that I'm actually on. Okay. Believe it or not, there's somebody um, waiting uh, even longer than you. That's like, we got one more call that was on since the beginning of the show. So. Okay. I guess I have, um, I'll try to make it quick. I was, um, a seventh day Adventist for, I'm 17 years old. So I just, um, like a week ago kind of told my parents and everything that I'm an atheist and they're both very religious people. They're both um, Seventh-day Adventists. I don't know if you guys know about that religion. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, so, um, it's a, uh, you know, they're not like some, I guess, radical Baptists in a way, you know. They don't march up and down the street, um, you know, with anti-gay signs and stuff like that. But they are... Um, I don't know. I guess they're kind of different. Um, so I was having a conversation with, um, I don't want to name them or anything. That's fine. But I was having a conversation with um, a Seventh-day Adventist, and he was talking about how the dating system, uh, about dating dinosaur bones and stuff, is incorrect, and how scientists, um, their the dating system they do or whatever is not right, and they can't actually, you know, say that oh this is millions of years old so that proves that the earth is this old and all of that stuff and that since they can't do that or since that it's in, he doesn't accept that idea then he says that leaves room for the um the god theory as he said it leaves room for this other um theory and so i was like okay but that still doesn't prove that god exists so i was wondering oh, like what welcome to our last call <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm sorry. I, I talked over you during that last sentence because it's just so appropriate based on the last call we had. But what was your summary there? Um, it was just kind of like, what do I say to someone who just doesn't accept that what the testing methods are is incorrect? Well, sometimes it, it's tough, but sometimes you have to accept the fact that regardless of what you say, you're not going to change someone's mind because they have such an emotional investment in the position that they're in, right? Uh, I feel like I'm less emotionally invested in my position of atheism because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, like, when I die, it's over with. So, like, I, I feel like there would be mm -hmm. more motivation for me to stick with a religion if I was a religious person. I'm not necessarily emotionally attached to being atheist. It's just kind of what I figured out I think is true about the world. So, at some level, you have to accept the fact that a lot of times, no matter what your best argument is, you're not going to change somebody's mind. And accept that sometimes mm -hmm. that's the position that you're going to get to. And aside from that, honestly, I think just do as much reading as you can. Learn as much about it as you can. So, because a, a lot of times I think people make the mistake of automatically assuming that the person they're speaking with is uninformed. And you can demonstrate, even if you don't get the other person to believe you, you they can come away with the conversation like, wow, that person really knew what they were talking about. And maybe that gives me something yeah. to think about. And so I, I think that's an important p place to start. Um, here's a good thing, though, just to let you know. There's a website called talkorigins.org. And it's very important to do mm -hmm. the .org or you'll end up somewhere not safe for work. So <laughs> talkorigins.org basically responds to questions like the ones we've been addressing with the other callers, right? Like Flat Earth and... Um, Noah's Ark and the global flood, and that deals specifically with the scientific rebuttals, right? So people that want to go there and yeah. want to do the science, you know, I'm going to sit and argue science with you. To me, uh, if you want to argue about the science of it, you should go find a scientist to argue with and then come to us, you know, once you've changed the mind of scientists. But for you, if you, if you actually, like what Callie is saying, someone comes to you and says these dating methods are not okay, and you're like, wow, is that true? The best thing you can do is go look it up and say, wow, is that true? And go and check a site like Talk Origins where they're going to talk about, you know, what is, what is the scientific support for the dating methods. And then you can read that and you can see if you agree that they are non-robust, right? Like, are these dating methods um, useful? Are they not useful? Are they reliable? Are they not reliable? When are they reliable? When are they not reliable? Um, because not all of these dating methods work in all circumstances. So... You sh I agree with Callie that, you, that a good thing to do is kind of go and look yourself and say, okay, so they're telling me that th these dating methods don't work. 
let's go see wh whether or not they do. And talkorigins.org is like a clearinghouse where you can go and get like a lot of information sort of put together that is directly dealing with um, creationist claims and versus that, that tend to go against scientific consensus. And it basically will tell you, here's what the science has to say about it. And then you can make a decision about whether or not um, you think that that's supported. And I would also consider that, uh, li like we did with some of the previous callers, so, okay, let's assume that you're correct. Let's give you the argument that you're making. How does that demonstrate that God exists? You know, we can say that yeah. if we assume that argument is true, maybe it's slightly more likely that God exists, maybe, depending on which specific argument you're talking about. But let's assume that's true. How does that demonstrate God? Maybe that just demonstrates that scientists have looked at the question and gotten things wrong, which science does all of the time. That doesn't mean that science is wrong. Right, but I guess the point that, that she's making is that they're telling her, well, this opens the door for God. But right. the fact is, science doesn't even have to be wrong to, if, for this guy to open the door for God, right? There are mm -hmm. certain things that we do not know in science, and, and uh, frankly, lots of theists just go there, right? We don't have an answer to this, and therefore that opens the door for God. You know, mm -hmm. we don't know this, and um, therefore, so even if, and that's kind of how I see, this, the scientific claims to me are, are kind of secondary, because you could sit and argue about them if you want, and you could say the dating methods are correct, but in the end, he could just flee to whatever science hasn't answered and say, let me plug in my God of the gaps yeah. there. And so all he's trying to do, which is kind of doing it the hard way, the easy way is just go to the gap and say <laughs> right. God. But what he's doing is he's trying to make a crack. He's trying to build right. a gap first and then insert his God. Yeah. And, I, and I think part of, part of what he, maybe not consciously, right? I, I'm not saying that he's doing this on purpose, but I think part of that process is not just to insert the God somewhere, but the way he's doing it also then tries to shake the foundations of, of uh, whether or not you can rely on science. Right, so what he also, the benefit yeah. of doing it the way he's doing it is to say, don't trust science. But the question is, if we don't trust a scientific dating method, what is his method of dating? And how is it reliable? Okay, so how old is he saying these dinosaur bones are? And how does he know this? And how is he getting his data? Yeah. Because he has no better methods, I can guarantee you. If he does, he needs to talk to some scientists and he needs to get them, you know, show them how to improve their methods. Yeah. And so and he, are... he doesn't know either. Yeah, there are um, a lot of, well, not a lot, I don't know, but there's, you know, Christian scientists. And so um, I guess he's kind of trying to rely on what they believe and uh, Christian scientists. And so he's always telling me like, well, people who are scientists, they always make fun of and like they pick on the Christian scientists as if it's like a high school bullying type thing. And I don't see why he's always trying to make them kind of like the victims and trying to make them seem like, well, these guys always get picked on, so they must be telling the truth. And hey, no, I, uh, yeah. no. So first yeah. of all, you know, most people are theistic, even in scientific communities, like especially in the United States. So it, it, there are less theists among certain sciences, but the fact is, you still have lots and lots of theistic people even in, in the science fields. Well, and the thing to point out with that too is that what you see a lot of times people arguing for creationism, you, they point out like, well, I have a PhD in whatever my PhD is in, but they're making a comment on a field that's not relevant to their degree. So they're saying like, well, I'm a geologist, mm -hmm. but I'm going to talk to you about why evolution isn't true because of organic chemistry. And so, I mean, if you're trying to to poke holes in someone's right. worldview, like obviously you don't want to step in like pre pretend you're an expert because that's what you're well, that's what you're criticizing these folks for doing. But I think that's an important thing to point out too. And then I think another important question to ask, it, it, because what we're kind of circling around is the God of the gaps, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, therefore God. Mm -hmm. And the question I always like to ask people is why is God the answer instead of I don't know? And, yeah. and that goes back yeah. to the like, oh, atheists are arrogant. Well, I would rather just say I don't know. Or even in the case of what you're dealing with, which isn't a therefore God, but more of a therefore maybe God. Right, therefore right? maybe And I'm God. kind of like, how do you even know it's, you know, maybe God? Like, uh -huh. where, wouldn't there, if we're going to say God might be the cause, wouldn't the next question be, well, okay, then we need to demonstrate there is a God because only things that exist or have existed can be the cause of other things. And so if, we, if, we, if we're going to assert that, hey, a God is causing this, the next question is, great, how do we model and demonstrate and 
you know, test for this God to see that yeah. it exists and can interact and do things in the ways that you're describing. But the but I guess to me the whole point is why would we insert any any cause for which we don't even have a demonstration of existence, past or present, with I don't know, right? Even if someone thought yeah. it could be a god, I would think that if that person was acting in good faith, their next thing would be to say, "I'm and I'm going to demonstrate that my god is exists and is doing this. I'm going to go find that way to, to demonstrate this, to measure this." But yeah. they'll say you can't, right? And it's and it's not fair to ask somebody to measure God, and then God becomes no more relevant than something that doesn't exist because you can't measure those things either. Yeah, um, I have one more question. It's not really about um, being atheist or anything. It's kind of about, I guess, liberals and um, so it's a show that I'm watching. It's um, I Am Jazz, and it's about you know this trans teenager who is trying to get. Uh, reassignment surgery or um, she's trying to like I guess make her penis into a vagina and so her doctor who's going to be doing the surgery said okay you need to lose 30 pounds of for me to be able to do the surgery and so uh, in one episode she's complaining about why does she have to lose 30 pounds and she doesn't want to and she's trying to work out but then she'll get fat again and so um, I know there's a lot of people, I've seen some videos on YouTube and debates about whether being fat has anything to do with being healthy. And a lot of people are saying there's fat discrimination and there's no link between, um, I guess, being overweight and versus being healthy. I was wondering what the guest view was on this, <laughs> I guess. I don't know if it has anything to do with being transgender, if she had to lose the 30 pounds or if it just... For the surgery, she had to lose. This is a perfect that much question. Weight. Yeah, for <laughs> Callie, this is great. I, I ha so I had I had my I had bottom surgery seven months ago, and I I mm -hmm. went through that that exact experience, um, and uh, mm -hmm. so I I had I also had weight loss surgery about a year ago, and my surgeon gave me a specific weight to hit. And what what it's actually about is how safe it is to perform surgery because anesthesia is uh, effectively it's a doctor bringing you closer to the point of death and keeping you on the edge. I mean that's that's a really overly simplistic mm -hmm. way to explain it, but that's what anesthesia is, and it gets a lot more risky the heavier you are. And so that's that's mm -hmm. the argument. And how that ties back into uh, discrimination against fat people, that 100% exists because I weighed 403 pounds before I had my weight loss surgery. So I, I had very personal experiences with that kind of discrimination. And um, it, it, it's a tough... It's a tough line because a lot of times if you go to a doctor and you say, I'm having this health problem, the doctor automatically defaults to your fat, lose weight, even it, w without any further yeah. examination. Um, I, I'm aware of a story where someone kept going to a doctor and saying, I'm having this specific kind of pain and it's happening a lot. And the doctor kept saying, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. And eventually this person found a doctor that listened to what they were saying. And it turned out they had a genetic problem that was, cause, that, that was causing problems with their nerves. It had absolutely nothing to do with their weight. But we know weight can be a health problem. Weight's not inherently a health problem, I think is what it comes down to. Because before my yeah. weight loss surgery, I was relatively healthy otherwise. I mean, I had some developing joint problems and like my blood tests, some of the levels were slightly off. But I was gen it is 100% possible to be a healthy person and overweight, um, but it can cause health problems. So there's, there's some nuance to the discussion there. Yeah. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of ways, okay. it's like anything. Like, um, for example, certain amounts of moderate drinking in uh, can cause increases in breast cancer rates. Mm -hmm. But that's the increase in breast cancer rates is, for example, one of the ways I think is a good way to explain it, right? So let's say that it causes a 30% increase in breast cancer rates, which I think is actually the percentage. I'd have to go and look to confirm, but that's what I seem to recall. It doesn't mean that if I drink, I have a 30% greater risk of breast cancer. It means that if me and a bunch of other women drink, we're collectively, like some of us at a rate of about 30% more, will end up with breast cancer as opposed to the other ones who don't seem to be affected by it as far as breast cancer, mm -hmm. right? So when somebody looks at being overweight, it's gonna be the same thing. 
extra weight on some people is probably going to trigger certain other issues because of other things about their physical reality, right? With who they are and how they're built and the, just like the genetic factors that go into them. Like not everybody that's heavy is gonna have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Some people that are heavy are gonna have horrible problems with sleep apnea. It just depends on, on the person and the other factors about them. Just because something increases risks doesn't mean it increases risk in the individual. It means it increases risk in that demographic. And so the idea, I think, behind the, I, I, the concept of the weight and the health is just the, uh, that we have this, first of all, we have a, a real hate on for weight, right? So it is sort of uniquely vilified as a thing that causes risk. So instead of somebody, yeah. if I have three glasses of wine, nobody is just like, oh my gosh, you're so unhealthy. Look <laughs> right. at you drink. You know, the doctor doesn't say, you know, how much are you drinking three glasses of wine? Holy cow, three glasses of wine a week. You're, you're killing yourself. You really need to cut down. I mean, even though it does put me at a much higher risk of, of something that's killing a lot of people. So it, it, there is this, yeah. this discrimination just as the, as the cause of the risk, right? We judge in a harsh way. Mm -hmm. But the other reality is that for some people, putting on that weight isn't ever going to be a problem for them. And you can't tell unless yeah. you're looking at the individual and the problems that they're having, whether or not the weight would be an issue for them or not be an issue for them. And so some people are going to have issues with it. Some people aren't. And for the people that aren't, they are, they're, say, they're living their lives and they're being fine. They're not getting diabetes. They're not having sleep apnea. They're not, you know, it's so, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you guys have time for one more question or is that it? Um, we're getting a little late, but throw it out there if it's something we could do quick. Okay. Um, well, agonists never really believe in hell. And so sometimes atheists or other people who you know, don't like the hell idea, they say, how can a God... Uh, torture and do all this stuff and that doesn't sound like a really you know good god or anything mm -hmm. but Adventists don't believe in hell so whenever someone would try to use that argument they can just quickly say well we don't believe in that either because that doesn't sound like a good god but then they accept other stuff about god but they don't seem that seems really harsh and um, messed up so like how I don't never understood like I guess um, why not atheists in particular or other people keep on using the hell argument about how can a God do that or how can you believe in a God who um, would do that if, you know, some religions or specifically Adventism doesn't even believe in that so it doesn't really work with them. Well, I don't think I would use the hell argument with somebody if I knew up front that they didn't believe in hell. Yeah. I, I, oh, I think yeah. that would be kind of a, a ridiculous argument to use with that particular person. Yeah, well, like, I guess it's just overall, it seems like Adventists kind of switch, like, every year. I, I kind of joke sometimes um, with my sister because it seems like every year Adventists kind of, like, change their viewpoints just a little bit to kind of fit in with um, modern society. Yeah, and, that's like, not unique to Adventism. <laughs> right. <laughs> The um well like I can only speak about that religion. Oh sure, sure. Yeah, I was just saying that's women. that's yeah. that's definitely a common yeah. thing among yeah. faith traditions. Um, yeah, so like the LGBTQ when that became like a really big um thing in the news and like a lot of that type of stuff was going on and people would look at religion and say, Well, you know, these are you know, they discriminate and they publicly discriminate the kind of religions that go around uh, marching in the streets, but with Adventists, it seemed like there's a lot of uh, a split within different churches, and there's, you know, the younger people in their 20s and 30s were, like, moving on, and they were actually breaking away from the church um, and starting their own churches that did include LGBTQ people, and now it just seems like every big thing that comes up in the news or whatever, Adventists kind of switch their viewpoints on it, and I don't see how they don't see the hypocrisy and like every year it seems like they're changing their minds about stuff and saying, oh, well, God says that's just symbolism or he wasn't, it, like they interpret it different every year so that it, they don't have to feel like they're different from society, like especially the young people. I think the way that a church justifies a thing like that is that they basically say that God is always right. And even if our understanding of what God is trying to communicate is wrong, the God is still right. So whatever the reality becomes is irrelevant because yeah. they can simply say, oh, and we misinterpreted the, the Bible on that and that's on us, not on God. 
Yeah, well, and I think you did a really yeah. good job of, of articulating a problem with the way that many mainstream faith traditions operate, right? I mean, basically what you said mm -hmm. is you did the argument. They say, well, these things are universally true, and then you can point back and say, well, here are some things that were universally true and all of a sudden weren't. Uh, you know, that that's, uh, you did a really good job of yeah. articulating yeah. why a lot of that doesn't make sense. And the question becomes, how do you know that what you believe right now is, is correct? And I mean, mm -hmm. that, that applies as well to, you know, even people that would adopt an evidence based view of, of reality, right? Because we could still, yeah. with incomplete evidence, you're going to have an incomplete uh, picture of things, mm -hmm. and you could be wrong on some aspects of it, and I understand that. But that doesn't mean that you throw the evidence out the window, because like I said before <laughs> with, the, with the dating thing, what else do you have? Right? right, it's like you kind of have yeah. to base your, your your thoughts and your navigation of reality on something. And if you can't base it on evidence, then what can you base it on? Well, they say they're basing it on God, but what you're describing is really they're just basing it on the same evidence the rest of us are, and then they're just saying God. It's kind of like the guy that was trying to prove Noah's Ark, right? It's like he he thinks that altering the reality somehow changes that problem and it doesn't. You still back up and say, why are you throwing in God? Whatever is the reality in front of you, why are you throwing in God? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your call, Samantha. Okay. I hope we were useful. Yeah, and best of luck in those conversations. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting stuff. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Okay. Take care. Okay, and we have one more that I said was a call in from the beginning of the show, and that would be Ben in Los Angeles, California. Thank you for your patience. You're on with Tracy and Callie. Hey, how's it going? Good. Thank you for waiting. All right. Yeah, no, no problem. Happy to be here. So uh, I've watched the show for a long time now, and uh, something, Tracy, that seems to uh, come up over and over again is someone will start talking about the soul and or spirituality. Mm -hmm. You'll ask them to define it, mm -hmm. and they'll ha you'll have a long conversation, and eventually they'll say something like, uh, God is love, or the soul is, sure. is just is, right? So I thought about that for a long time. And uh, full disclosure, I'm an atheist, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought about that for a long time and wanted to come up with a definition of a soul and spirituality for you that hopefully you can understand and, and uh, you know, uh, feel satisfied with. But I, I doubt anyone... Uh, I guess my question, let, let me ask, a, I was going to say, let me ask a question first, because, I mean, before we get going... I could define mm -hmm. a soul as like this, this uh, you know, as Muhammad here. And I, I could say, okay, there's the soul. But it, if, if, I, if this isn't what other people are trying to communicate, it wouldn't be useful to me. I, I, I think it is what people are trying to communicate. How would he know uh, that? Because they're not here say. to agree or disagree. But, but please go ahead. Let, let me go ahead and right. let you do your definition. Let's hear it. Yeah. So, so yeah. And, and so this is a, a hard thing to do is say, you know, I don't think that this is going to be a definition that somebody who believes in a soul would say is correct, but I think it does capture what they are feeling. All right. So you're, you're so, kind so of giving your interpretation of what might really be going on with what they're struggling to describe. Yes. Okay. So, Basically, it started with, I studied computer science, and something I found really interesting studying that uh, was that the, the fundamentals of all computers, how they all work, is just three pieces of logic uh, that I'm not going to go very deep into, just to say that you, you have this logical conception of and, or, and not. And between those three logical concepts, that's how you can build the fundamental hardware of all computers. Okay. And so it made me think about what's the analog in humans? Do we have some sort of similar logical conception? Uh, and, and I came to the conclusion that it, the base level could not be logical because logic came much later in the evolutionary process. So I was thinking about, okay, well, what's the irreducible fundamental part of our experience? And philosophically, you get to qualia, which is notoriously hard to define beyond the, the stuff of our experience, right? So basically, the idea here is that you have uh, just basically one type of thing that's the fundamental unit of qualia for humans. 
Uh, and, and I'm just going to call it feelings, and that's going to encompass external sensory information. Um, for example, if you touch something, like if you touch the desk in front of you, you're feeling it with your hands, right? But I would also use the term feeling to describe the light that comes into your eye is being felt by the back of your eye and being turned into the sensation. Um, and then, you know, similar feeling, um, but more internally is feelings like hunger that are, you know, your body trying to tell you something, but they manifest in a way that is not directly describable. And then finally, you have uh, your emotional feelings, something like happiness and sadness, which are even harder to describe and even harder to convince someone that you are really experiencing it today. And so with these ideas in mind, I would say that what people claim is the soul is really just the part of your brain that isn't generating conscious thoughts and conscious experience. And so that, that might be, you know, most of the brain, I'm not a neuroscientist, I can't give you a, a hard percentage of what that would be, but I think it's suffice to say that there is a much older part of the brain that is most of the brain that does a lot of thinking and a lot of information processing that we as conscious entities don't get direct experience with most of the time, except for say strange meditation states or weird psychedelics or something like that. Um, well, let me just stop you for a minute um, because I may, mm -hmm. it, it may not be necessary to go on um, because I, I, while I'm not sure whether or not any individual who is describing a soul may, you know, would, would concur with what you're describing. Mm -hmm. Um, Jung, for example, felt that the the subconscious drove belief in God because the, the, the human being, via their experience, was like, where do these things come from? Right? Where do my feelings mm -hmm. come from? Where do my... So in the days before, you know, we could map your brain, look at things from a more neurological perspective, uh, we had this sort of right. mis mystery behind... I mean, there were some observable things that you could draw assumptions from, like you always still had the issue of brain damage where you could see what would happen to a person if their brain was damaged, and you could mm -hmm. infer, confer some things from that or infer some things from that. But the the fact is um, people... He felt that from a psychological standpoint, people were sort of confused about what was driving these things. And when I talk to theists, it, it, I understand why he mm -hmm. would draw that conclusion because many of them will associate the existence of God with feelings, okay? So they will say, like, I had this mm -hmm. feeling. And they start really getting into that area that you're talking about of, like, I felt this. Yeah. I had this connection, this, this like, emotional sort of physical feeling, this, this experience that was so unique and so uh, intense mm -hmm. that... Mm -hmm. That's that's why I believe in a God now, because where did this come from? And it's sort of inconceivable to them that these things come from yourself. Like, that's not yeah. something that they are even willing to entertain in, in a lot of cases. And the other mm -hmm. issue is, um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember. I, I can't remember. But that, that, was, that was one of the things where uh, people, I've heard people associate these things with God. Right, so that God is causing this experience, yeah. or God is God is, is this is this is God talking to me. Now, whether or not they're right. viewing that additionally as a conduit, right? Like like that that is the sole part of me that <laughs> integrates mm -hmm. with God. I don't really yeah, know. Yeah, that works either. <laughs> but but the other oh gosh, I keep having these flashes of you know the the other issue, life being alive. Mm -hmm. There are people who actually associate it. Um, like the, the the interpretation of the of the term soul uh, comes from actually a word that is about life and being alive, things that are alive, mm -hmm. right? And so you have this idea of of a thing that lives it lives in it, and, and you breathe life into something, so it's breath, right? So you've got the breath, and the thing mm -hmm. is living. Um, and in fact, I think that is the literal thing is, is more breath. But uh, the idea is it's alive and breathing. <laughs> and so that's the soul. And it mm -hmm. was a way of differentiating animate things from inanimate things. Things that were alive, right, in the Bible were things with a soul. Mm -hmm. And things that weren't alive were things that had no soul. Um, but the soul, yeah. the model of the soul was very different, right? The model of the afterlife was very different. Like what we have today in Christianity mm -hmm. is completely different models than what they used in the Old Testament. 
And right. so you have this kind of thing, too, where there are some people who want to say that somehow being alive is, uh, you know, that, that experience of living is somehow associated. Mm -hmm. And again, they tend to, when I talk to them, associate that more with God. When I get into the soul situation, I do get the, the weirder answers, like you're describing, where somebody will say mm -hmm. um, just strange things that, that are almost contradictory sometimes, where I'll be like, that doesn't even make sense. But uh, mm -hmm. I have heard them associate these things with God. Whether or not this is what they're trying to describe as a soul or how much that would feed into it, I really don't know. It's not that I don't hear what you're saying. I just don't know if that's really mm -hmm. what they mean or not. But it certainly is uh, tied to conversations around what people would describe as a religious experience. In the conversations that I've had, yeah. I would almost say, I, I think that what it is, is is kind of the opposite of what you're saying because the, the way that, that the conversations I've had generally go is what I'm hearing people describing as their soul is their conscious experience because they say like, well, that's what separates us from the mm. animals is our, our feelings and our morality and our logic and our, able to, our, our ability to think, uh, our like personal agency. And so mm -hmm. if we're trying to analyze what's in somebody head, somebody's head, which is a dangerous thing to do, but I mean, if we're just trying to think of this on a philosophical level and trying to think like, what are they actually talking about? What I generally associate it with, just based on the conversations that I've had, is that people are talking about their conscious experience as the differentiator between me and a, a dog or a cat or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I think in, the, in that model, if they say that the soul is consciousness, then I would say that the God they claim to communicate with would then be that older part of the brain that does a lot of processing that we don't really understand. That would make um, a lot of sense and to then me. Just, yeah, and so, and so yeah, this, this whole idea was just motivated by listening to people talking about this intense feeling and coming from the perspective that they aren't lying that they're having this feeling that they're really being mm -hmm. honest about what they're feeling and what they're experiencing and that they're having a hard time clearly making sense of it. And so I wanted to try and make some sense of it from my point of view as you know an atheist and materialist. And just to wrap it up really quickly, um, the definition of spirituality that I would give is an, instead of saying that it's love or some fuzzy thing, it's the communication of the conscious part of your brain and the unconscious part of your brain is what I would call spirituality is that that actual communication because your brain does communicate that way. Yeah, I mean, thinking from that point of view, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I mean, we were talking earlier about how there's some um, definitions of spirituality that have been thrown out for use in the medical community that have to do with just the, mm -hmm. the, the reality of people being social creatures. It was that are said social. That they, they, they use soccer as a spiritual yeah, practice. Yeah, they had, they had soccer <laughs> yeah. listed as a spiritual practice, right? That. Uh, uh -huh. That because it's because it's an interaction between people. That is the that is that is what they were defining as special as uh, spirituality was that the interconnectedness of people. So it, it's really you know what people are mean by it is it's going to be an incredibly unique thing. It's not that I think that there's no value yeah. in trying to you know help figure out what they're saying, but I in these cases I feel so bereft of understanding what they mean because when I looked through the things that I was defining in a religious context and came to the conclusion that wow these things just don't even exist and I, you know I, I was just making up things that weren't there right and mm -hmm. so I had to kind of let go of that stuff but what but I but I don't what I learned early on was that what other people meant by it wasn't what I had meant by it or what I had intended by those terms. And so I had to kind of let mm -hmm. go of that and let people define it for themselves. That's just a, especially a thing where you, like what you're describing where they can't really show it to me. They can't take it out and show it. So they have to describe what it is they're saying. And sometimes I'm good. I mean, there are people that have described feelings to me or experiences to me that I may not share but I can still say, okay, mm -hmm. I understand what you're describing, right? I get what you're, what you're describing, even though I've never had that experience myself. I still understand you because it relates to things that I do understand. But when it comes to these discussions, mm -hmm. a lot of times they're trying to relate to things. When they do relate to something I understand, then it becomes really mundane. And when I say, okay, so is this what you're describing? Yeah. They say no. And then I'm like, well, then I don't understand. <laughs> it's, it's love, but not the love that you understand love as. And it's like, well, then how does that help? Right. Uh, but I mean, it, I, I do appreciate the call. Um, I don't know if this is what people mean or not. I understand why you would think these things are certainly related to religious mm -hmm. discussion. Uh, and that's about all I really can say about it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, if I can just say one more thing, 10 seconds. Sure. Um, the idea that I came up with uh, of explaining our consciousness without, um, you know, going metaphysical or claiming there's a soul is 
just relating to the idea again that if the base thing, the base type of thing in our head is a feeling uh, for our conscious experience, then I would define our conscious experience as feeling the feeling of feeling feelings. I have no argument with that. <laughs> I, I tend to think I'm a robot and I'm not like other people and they're having some experience that I don't understand. I'm like, I'm processing stuff, how I process stuff, and I, maybe other people have a different experience of that. But, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. so That's a hard problem. I appreciate your call. Thank you for calling in. All right, yeah, thanks so much for you. taking my call. Okay, bye. All right, thank you. Bye. I do want to note that I have not noted that we do have an after-dinner event open to the public uh, at the Star of India, and I think we have an address for that that our wonderful crew can put up on the screen somewhere. There we go, right, the after-show <laughs> dinner where everyone is invited. Now, I know that normally I go ahead and clear the board and take the calls, but we do have a gigantic audience. We're already 10 minutes overdue, and I don't want to hold all these folks up for dinner because then I'm going to I'm gonna need security escort out of the, the building. So, yeah, there's a right? long path to the door. Yeah, <laughs> and people are going to get the hangry, right? <laughs> they'll, get, they'll get hangry at me. So I, I think we are going to cut this off. If, you're, if you didn't get your call taken, I apologize to you. You can either post at the blog and get your questions you know, directed there. We do have the, the show blog that has the open thread for today's show, and you're welcome to express your ideas and have them uh, examined and looked at and have people respond to you. I want to thank the crew and you know production staff that are always here and always wonderful and supportive, and thank you to my guest, Callie Wright. Yeah, thank you to our me. wonderful audience, and uh, we're, I guess, going to go ahead and head out to dinner. <laughs>